Traditional trade relations destroyed, soaring energy prices, and the threat of severe global food shortages. How has Russia's conflict with Ukraine changed the global economy? Welcome to the program. I'm Philip Hampshire. When Russia attacked Ukraine, it not only caused the biggest geopolitical crisis in Europe since World War II, it changed some of the fundamentals about how nations trade with each other. The conflict in Ukraine played havoc with the global food supply, causing price spikes in food commodities immediately after the invasion, which persisted over time. The economic reverberations of this conflict will extend far beyond Ukraine's borders. It's now clear that the double whammy of the pandemic and the war has disrupted supply chains, increased inflationary pressures, and lowered expectations for output and trade growth. As one of the world's largest grain exporters, Ukraine plays a central role in world food production. Russia's blockade of that supply in regions already affected by conflict and climate change contributed to a food security crisis, notably in Africa and the Middle East. In European countries, the cost of basic goods continued to soar for months as governments struggled to keep inflation at bay. In some cases, prices are still rising. Europe faced an energy dilemma, having to reduce its dependence on Russian oil and gas as winter approached and find alternative energy sources. Russia itself was hit by severe sanctions as the West attempted to isolate the country internationally, causing Moscow to seek new ways to trade. So have we seen a permanent restructuring of the global economy along geopolitical lines? In London, we have Yuri Polaniv. He's a former member of the Ukrainian parliament and a former deputy head of the supervisory board of the National Bank of Ukraine, currently an independent researcher. Also in London, Arno Petit. He is the executive director of the International Grains Council. And meanwhile, in Dublin, we're joined by Alicia Garcia Herrero, who is the chief economist for the Asia-Pacific at the French investment bank Natixis and a senior fellow at Bruegel, which is a think tank based in Brussels. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Uh, Yuri, if I can go to you first. For you, what do you think the war in Ukraine has changed most for the global economy? Well, it, um, it has affected uh, the world in a very profound way. It basically split the world into um, uh, a democracy coalition and uh, autocracy coalition. And uh, uh, it creates um, a new world order, uh, many features of which are not yet known. Uh, but we are all hopeful that um, this emerging new uh, world order uh, will be uh, the place where democratic values will be upheld. And Ukraine is at the forefront of this global battle. Does that not run slightly counter to sort of the increased globalization of the world economy that we've seen over the last 20 to 30 years? <clears throat> well, the recent um, researchers, as far as um, um, you know, I'm in it, uh, says that the globalization will not be uh, reversed by the war. It will be changed in a very profound way. Uh, it will be something like weaponized interdependence where you know, power politics and uh, uh, competition, um, fierce competition will will be the, the, the key features, also security concerns, peace concerns, but the globalization will not be changed. Trade uh, will remain globalized, even uh, despite the fact that now uh, there's a big question about the global supply chains uh, and, uh, and other issues, but um, uh, the war is not going to turn around uh, the basic feature of the world that allowed uh, millions of people uh, to come out of uh, poverty and uh, become basically parts of, uh, of civilization. Arno, um, from your perspective, what do you think the war on Ukraine has changed most about the global economy? First of all, I would like to fully agree with the producer speaker. So globalization, even in the grain sector, continue to increase. Um, the change is about the strategies for the 
traders before they were working on just in time and now they have to move to a just in case so diversification of originations of the so for the supply um, all the operators to move the grains also need to be a more uh, cautious in the way they are acting so that's really a new strategy and the second point i would like to highlight is the cost of fi of trade finance has increased tremendously Three years ago, I would say the money was cheap to do trade. Today, it has changed tremendously, and particularly for importers. That's a point we will need to address and to discuss further in a, in a short to medium term. Alicia, you're a specialist in uh, East Asia. So I assume things have been very different from that perspective as well. Yes, uh, let me start with the global uh, impact, inflation. Uh, yeah, energy inflation, food inflation are the worst of all times because we already had inflationary pressure. So the whole world has much higher interest rates after uh, the, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And that, that's a direct effect on the whole world. But from Asia, interestingly, we have not seen this big increase in inflation. Actually, uh, especially China has had very, very mild inflation uh, since the war started, and and that's quite quite a, a, a sign that we are moving into bifurcated uh, economy. So we just heard that the world is divided in two in terms of values and and uh, political regimes. The world is starting to be divided in two in terms of supply chain uh, ecosystems and and technology ecosystems and standards ecosystems. So that's that's partially because of Ukraine, although it was, of course, coming already from the trade war which uh, Trump initiated and the response from China thereafter. When you say the world's been divided uh, into on an economic front, where are you drawing the lines on that? Is it the West on one side and everybody else? Or is it sort of North and South America and Europe on one side? How is the split presenting itself? A, a very good question because we don't have the lines yet. This is like literally the world before Second World War or First World War. I mean, we're, we're drawing the lines. Uh, for China, and actually Xi Jinping with his latest speech literally two days ago on the Global Security Initiative, uh, would like to draw the lines exactly as you described, the West against everybody else. But I don't think that's where we are today. Uh, many countries are really pondering about what side uh, fits them best, uh, even economically. Uh, zero COVID policies in China for three years have also made quite a few uh, realize that it's not necessarily the, 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 you know, a sure bet. I am not saying it's a good bet, but it's not a sure bet. Uh, China's state-led uh, economy also has its flaws, and we've seen it in, in zero COVID policies and the massive cost for the Chinese economy. So I would argue that everybody, everybody's just on the wait and see, some more than others. Uh, some have already turned the, the, the page. We could think of North Korea, Iran, you know, countries that in a way were already out of the Western world. But other than that, I think the others are, are on a wait and see mode for the moment. Yuri, you had a comment you wanted to make. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting um, uh, split. Yes, it's a value-based split. Uh, it's also, uh, a, you know, a, a split based on the world outlook. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, by GDP, 70% um, of, um, of, uh, of the global world uh, supports Ukraine and denounces the aggression, whereas 30, slightly more, support Russia and uh, another 32 are neutral. And the key question is, uh, these neutral countries, are they simply opportunistic, um, uh, you know, waiters, a wait and see position to see who's, uh, who's uh, uh, going to have a, an upper hand, or these countries are uh, hesitating um, uh, because of some other reason, economic or trade or so on. I suspect that uh, there is no simple answer to that. But in my view, that um, uh, if Ukraine and Ukraine will prevail, um, then uh, there'll be a decisively uh, a new impetus, a new 
uh, momentum in, in in this geopolitical uh, development, which is uh, uh, groundbreaking. I know we were hearing from Alicia that um, there have obviously there's been inflation in the global economy, and some of that can be traced <clears throat> back to what's been going on in Ukraine. A lot of that, of course, is happening in the food price arena. If we were to take a look at the price of um, maize or corn, as it's called in the United States over the course of the last few years, there's been an enormous spike. Uh, similarly, we've seen an enormous price, uh, price spike in wheat. Um, also, some of the other sort of commodities people don't tend to think about that Ukraine is a specialist in, like sunflower oil. So what do you see happening in the markets there? The market has now reacting. We had a good supply. Despite the war in Ukraine, uh, in wheat production increased by 10 million tons. Uh, on maize, we are um, less than expected, but we are still uh, above the five years average. So now, the, if you look about the price, we are going down, I would say more than the historical basis. Uh, but anyway, as it has been mentioned, there is inflation. And inflation uh, comes from energy costs, uh, come also from trading interest rate and made a totally different uh, landscape for the trade finance, particularly in the grain sector. And I would add here also that uh, I fully agree with uh, the, the approach of uh, division, but there is some countries, new countries, I'm just coming from Dubai, and I can tell you in terms of food strategies, they are very proactive and they try to be a new platform in terms of processing grains and re-exporting to different countries. So that's something new. And today, the situation and the war in the Black Sea region is definitely giving a push to these countries, which are trying to, to take a new share of the grain trade or semi-processed product. In vegetable oil, Brazil will do a record harvest uh, by, uh, by March. So therefore, uh, the price of uh, vegetable oil is now cooling down, which is also good news in terms of uh, food inflation. Um, how much of a buffer is there in the global food system at the moment? You've mentioned that more food does seem to be coming onto the marketplace. Is that because it's still being able to come out of Ukraine, or is that because other producers have managed to step up to the plate? Two, two things. First of all, we, are very, uh, we have been very lucky to get this uh, grains corridor agreement, which allow all the grain from the Black Sea region to get out that region. So it was very crucial. 30% of the grain trade is coming from that region. And second point, we have seen also India now more and more uh, in a position of in a regular exporter, 10 million tons of wheat in average in, in a year. And it's also a new player in Asia Pacific, which can bring, I would say, some balance uh, with the situation currently in, in the Black Sea. Yuri, we've been talking about the uh, food there, but of course, underlying all of this is, as we've already indicated, energy. If we were to look at Russian oil exports to the European Union, well, unsurprisingly, with all the sanctions over the last 18 months or so, the, that has been tumbling away. However, it's been rapidly rising in other places in the world. Um, what do you make of that particular, again, bifurcation in the market? Um, Russia, uh, by invading Ukraine, has um, uh, shoot uh, itself in the, in the in the leg, if I may so, may say so, um, because uh, the eventual prize that it got was uh, a complete loss of uh, uh, European market, the biggest and the most stable market um, that Russia has tried to create and actually. Uh, to keep weaponized uh, for a long time, for a long, long time, for decades. Now Russia has lost that. Uh, Russia has also uh, been losing quite quickly um, the oil uh, market, especially uh, in the countries that uh, introduced um, uh, oil sanctions on on Russia. Uh, but uh, it tried to diversify supplies uh, by selling oil at huge discount to China. Uh, India, uh, some other countries uh, in South Southeast Asia, um, and because uh, because they are you know seeing it as an opportunity, but this, in my view, is not a sustainable uh, pattern. Uh, first of all, sooner or later, the financial sanctions 
will start to erode the system that Russia is trying to build because because um, uh, oil still um, uh, is is uh, uh, transacted in dollars. Dollars uh, are, are, and financial sanctions are <clears throat> such that Russia won't be won't have much freedom um, to use that. Um, if Russia is trying to switch into um, Yuan, uh, renminbi, um, it's not also going to to work on a large scale. <clears throat> uh, and for for Russia, it's um, it's a lose lose game. Uh, as natural gas is concerned, um, even if it completes the the pipeline to China, that is going to change a little bit the situation. But again, China is using that to basically. Uh, keep Russia uh, within its sphere of influence, and uh, the more uh, Russia's uh, going to China, uh, the more risks eventually um, it's it's going to face. So, uh, for, for it's not a good picture for Russia at the moment, and uh, s- sanctions uh, are uh, improving in terms of um, uh, their um, implementation. Uh, Russia, e- Russia's economy is going to face enormous, enormous squeeze. This year already, um, uh, it's going to face some shortfalls in export revenues connected with oil and gas. And next year, uh, uh, you know, some economists say that even uh, something close to collapse is uh, unavoidable for Russia, which means that the sanctions are actually hitting the target, uh, Russia's ability to finance the war. Alicia, uh, Yuri has mentioned there, obviously, China. If we look at the East Asian perspective from energy, aren't they actually winning, as it were, out of this? Because they're picking up all this extra oil that's cheap on the markets. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to uh, step up on this idea that uh, Russia is losing. Russia might be losing, but others are winning, and that's the rest of Asia. Uh, not only because uh, basically imports from uh, energy imports for this gas or oil are much cheaper than they used to be, but also because, and this is basically China, uh, China is is literally uh, controlling the future of Russia. And that's a humongous victory for China down the road. To the point that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is not really only about uh, just cheap imports of energy. Uh, China is expecting much more, uh, as as I've always heard from Chinese friends. It, Russia is China's barking dog, and that's the way we should see it. So this means that for China to accomplish a change in the global liberal order, uh, Russia is the best way to basically bark before China takes action. And and that that is a big bark. And I'm very sorry, you know, for for those that are in between, and in this case is, of course, Ukraine. But the objective is much broader than that. The, the objective is really to change the liberal, the global liberal order. And for that, I think um, China, which is the point I'm, I'm going to make, uh, will support Russia to the very end, because no other partner in this global security initiative that China is pushing would believe that China is ready to support them unless China supports Russia. So so this is why this battle um, beyond the values is really a battle about global dominance. And therefore, uh, I, I expect this battle to last very long. Yuri, do you agree with that? Not, not in all, uh, not in all aspects. I don't think that uh, Russia is of big interest to China. Uh, China uh, is is a different uh, a superpower of a different weight and technological capability, which Russia isn't. Russia is basically a, uh, a you know a a, a gas uh, a gas station with nuclear uh, weapons, uh, a gas pumping station with nuclear weapons. Uh, I am not uh, underestimating its uh, potential, but. Uh, it's definitely not in the in at, at the forefront of the technological revolution, even though it is a space uh, uh, country. But for China, uh, uh, this uh, you know temporary uh, taking temporary advantage of the situation on the oil market doesn't mean any strategic advantage. I think China's looking. Uh, 
perhaps at the possibility where Russia is starting to uh, fall apart and then uh, you know Far East uh, is uh, is something that China has always been interested in and that's a different story uh, as as a you know as a, as a partner it's not equal it's not of the same weight it's not of the same caliber I know um if we go back to looking at China uh, and East Asia as those nations uh, around the Pacific Rim have been benefiting from lower energy prices and lower inputs in other ways by being able to buy stuff at a discount from Russia, a lot of people don't realize China is one of the world's largest food producers in many rather unusual areas, from kiwi fruit across to grapefruit, across to melons, rice as well, of course. Um, so what are you seeing com uh, coming through in Asian food prices? Is it different than the North American and European experience? Well, the, it's, it's a different, uh, but we have to bear in mind that those countries are not to import uh, in regions where the price of wheat or maize is a bit higher. So that means they are facing some overcost. And the second thing, we have seen some uh, countries uh, like India, uh, but also Indonesia or Philippines developing their own food security systems program to support local production. And so these countries are having a balance. They are not so, uh, facing so much food inflations but it has a lot of public support for the domestic production. So that's the first point. And the second point is um, th we, what we, we expect, I would say, or forecast for 23, 24, is maybe a shift between wheat and rice consumption. Uh, if the economic uh, forecasts are um, better than expected, we could expect uh, still a good consumption of wheat, but we, we have seen already some shift and some consumption back on rice-based products. So that's something we, we have really to, to look at, and we know how the rice market is very sensitive when there is some shock in terms of demand. So that's, we are still to take care of the situation in, in that region, definitively. What about areas of the world that have traditionally been large food importers, regions like Africa? In, in Africa, I would say that's the main region which is suffering uh, for two reasons. First of all, as I already said, the price of the, of the commodities, which was very, uh, very high. Uh, and the second point is all the exchange uh, currencies have very went down uh, for after, after, the, after COVID. And that means a, a country like Ghana, which usually supplies its wheat from North America, uh, would have now more or less in dollar per ton an increase of 8% of the price of wheat. But if you change it in your local currency, it's plus 69%. So you see how the change is tremendous in that region. And we are, we are facing at the time being less trade on wheat from the sub-Saharan Africa particularly. And in North, uh, in North Africa, th those countries are more used to have uh, some uh, public agencies which are doing the call for tender and buying, so having the backing of the banks, the central banks. So in that way, they can operate on the global trade. But we know that in one point of time, this type of policy will have some limits to not have a further de uh, de decrease uh, exchange rate. So North Africa next year might be also very difficult for them in terms of net importers. So that's really the, the region which is suffering the most is really Africa. Alicia, um there's been plenty of analysis of what's been going on in Ukraine. In Europe, what do you say to people who say globalization is now dead? It's all going to be, forget offshoring, it's all going to be about nearshoring. It, we're going to stop exporting stuff around the world. We're going to deal with everything domestically. What do you do when you come across somebody like that? Well, I don't think we can do that uh, because the world is much more complex than it used to be. To, to just produce semiconductors, you need design, you need foundries, uh, you know, the investment to create a foundry hovers around 20 billion US dollars. I don't think many companies can, do, many countries can do that. So for sure, we cannot move back to self-reliance in every single country. However, uh, we will certainly see regional development. So on the one hand, we, we are already experiencing uh, reshuffling of supply chains away from China. So companies are moving, I wouldn't say away than this, in the sense of leaving China, but putting the additional unit of investment elsewhere so as to have two ecosystems. So this, the South Korea, starting with Samsung, did that already in 2008 uh, with Vietnam. 
and you already seen a lot of Taiwanese investment, Japanese investment go into Southeast Asia. Um, that's the idea of China plus one. And for the Koreans, it's China plus N, meaning many other options, not only one option, because you could end up, say, Vietnam being in, in China's ecosystem, standard or technological ecosystem, then you have not diversified away. Yuri, do you yeah, agree I, with all of that? I, yeah, I, I agree. I would add also that uh, the, um, the um, globalization will continue. It will definitely uh, be a different type of uh, globalization. It will change. Um, there'll be increased costs associated with, this, with these confrontations uh, along many lines. Um, military security, cyber, uh, supply chains, all that will put additional strain on uh, economies, on the businesses. Um, it's, but there is also be a, a bigger element of um, uh, global politics. Um, you know, this so-called power politics will, will become a prominent feature of this um, new globalized world. Yuri, Arno, Alicia, thank you very much for your time agreeing to talk about these subjects. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye.